Yeah. Um, this is a, this is a slideshow, or it's a variant of a slideshow that I've used a few times over the years to talk about Cy Twombly. Um, so, so my history with Cy Twombly is that I didn't know about him until he was dead, uh, and um, I, he had there was an obituary in a in a um, a blog that I was following back in 2011. And um, it was illustrated with a couple of his paintings. And I don't know, I, I hadn't seen anything like that. And I was kind of taken with, and I don't remember which ones they were, but I was kind of taken with them, and I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And um, so that was the beginning of several years of me being kind of interested in Twombly and his work. Um, there was no biography there really still isn't although there is a there is a book um called chalk by a fellow whose name i forget um but it's not really much of a biography because um, um nobody uh participate nobody cooperated with um joshua rivkin um, in the making of it, he had found a lot of troubles as a as a reporter, trying to get details about Twombly's life. Um, in any case, I did a lot of um, minor research and put together slideshows, and I, I did a I did a a blog, a website on Cy Twombly, and I went to a couple of different places around the United States and actually in um, in London to see Twombly's things. Um, what's interesting is, from, from my point of view, is that I was always of, of of two minds about Twombly. Sometimes I really, really liked this stuff. <laughs> And other times, um, other aspects of his work just yeah, didn't do anything for me. I was not, not entirely repelled, but um, I, I was ambivalent. That's, and I think that's really good in, when you're interested in something to be ambivalent about it. There's a lot to be said there because it makes for, um, it makes for lively responses. Um, I, I felt for a long time that way about um, Henri Corbin. And, and um, it's, I mean, I suppose it sort of prevents you from, from being overly um, um, hagiographic, you know, uh, when you have a, when you're interested in, in a person in particular, who's a hero to you, then, then um, your judgment is often um, little suspect. Um, in any case, I was always ambivalent about Twombly and never quite clear in my own mind about why I liked his stuff or, or didn't even. Um, in any case, um, I think Paul Winkler's got this right. He wrote, uh, size paintings are the freest, most open work ever created and the viewer must be as free and as open as the paintings to share their exhilarating presence. I don't think that's true of all of his stuff. That would be a surprise. But I think it's true of some of it. And because his works can be a real challenge to approach, um, you have to work hard to be as open as Winkler suggests we should be in order to understand it and to respond to it, um, his work as a whole. Uh, he was born in Virginia and, um, <laughs> and was very much a, a, a Southerner. Um, 
he referred to himself as just a guy from Chitlin Switch um, who developed a real love for the Mediterranean. That's the reference here to the Greek island. Uh, this is a picture of Cy in his teenage years. He was always destined to be an artist. He went to Black Mountain College for one year at the invitation of um, Robert Rauschenberg, who he befriended in New York in 1949. Um, and, and he and Rauschenberg were friends and eventually lovers for some period of time. This is this is Twombly at the, in the Black Mountain years in front of one of his early works. Uh, um, at, it, it's of more than historical interest that while Twombly was at Black Mountain, Charles Olson was the rector there. Um, so Olson knew of Twombly and everyone knew of Olson. Uh, he probably didn't take a course from him, um, but Olson was a presence there and was um, really positively impressed with with Twombly's work even back then. This is Olson teaching at Black Mountain. This is Robert Rauschenberg during the Black Mountain years. And as I said, he and he and Twombly is a photograph of Twombly by Rauschenberg during that time. Um, this is one of Twombly's early paintings. It's called Minoe. Um, and a lot of his early work was glyph-like and primitivist like this. And there's a long interesting story about the role of glyphs as a theme at Black Mountain during those years. There's a great book called Leap Before You Look, um, which is a wonderful large format edited volume about um, art and artists at, um, at Black Mountain. I uh, highly recommend that as a source for Twombly and other people. This is um, um, Tisnet, which he did after he and Rauschenberg spent a year traveling through Southern Europe and North Africa. Um, this is on display at the um, Menil Gallery, um, Twombly Pavilion. And this is a big painting. Uh, this is a good, it's like four feet, feet by five feet, something like that. And this is a good time to emphasize to all of you something that um, Kirk Varnado says in, in his little book on Twombly's, well, it's actually a, 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 an exhibition catalog from a MoMA exhibition in the she's 70s, 80s. Um, there was a Twombly retrospective at MoMA in New York and, and Kirk Varnado was then the curator of modern art, painting anyway, um, at MoMA. And in that piece, Varnado says, makes the point that um, all of, none of Twombly's work translates very well in reproduction which I have found to be absolutely true. You can get an idea and get a sense perhaps of what you're looking at, but you cannot appreciate Twombly's works unless you see them in person. Um, and, I, and also, um, Robert Duncan? Yeah, Robert Duncan. Was it Duncan? My gosh. I think it was, wrote a review, um, a very short review. Couldn't have been Robert Duncan. Who am I thinking of? Oh, oh, of course, it wasn't Robert Duncan. It was, um, <laughs> I'll think of it in a minute, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, 
in a review of um, an early show of um, Twombly's in New York, and I mean early for the 1950s, um, Frank O'Hara said that Twombly's work was best seen um, in its own context. That is, if you saw him not compared with other artists, but if you saw his work only um, in a show of just his work. I, 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 that's been my experience, um, but then um, I'm not an art critic, uh, but I will say that the, um, um, the Twombly Pavilion in Houston at the Menil Gallery um, is, a, is a wonderful um, example of that. And it is um, worth a trip to Houston just to see the Twombly Pavilion there. Renzo Piano designed it specifically for Twombly, and Twombly sh chose the works that were to be exhibited there. Um, and it's pretty remarkable. And as I said, Tisnet from the late 50s is, is, is displayed there. So keep in mind for all of these that you really have to, with the possible exception, I will say, of the small drawings. Um, None of these paintings come across in um, in reproduction. This, for instance, um, gosh, I really should have the. Well, let's see. Um, this, for instance, is a painting from the from the fifties, um, which um, is large, large format. It's like you know five five feet or so. And um, I haven't seen I haven't seen this particular one. Um, yeah, here we go. Uh, mm, oh dear, I'm trying to see what my ah oh, there we go speaker notes. Do do excuse me here while I see if I can. I should be pausing this recording. There we go. Now I've got it. Okay, because I have speaker notes for some of these, which don't show up on the screen here. Ah, so this is Free Wheeler from 1955, and it's quite large. It's probably five feet by five feet. Um, in during that period, um, Twombly wrote the only commentary on his work that he ever wrote. And he said, he wrote, each line is now the actual experience with its own innate history. It does not illustrate. It is the sensation of its own realization. And that's something I want to keep in mind for our exercises in writing or drawing or um, painting. Each line is the actual experience. It does not illustrate, it is the sensation of its own realization. Because quite clearly what Twombly was doing was not making pictures, although he referred to them as pictures. Um, um, and this is Ferragosto one from 1961, which is also, um, you know, seven feet by six feet, something like that's quite large. Um, Later in the Swan 1962, which is also large, I haven't seen it. Um, it's one of the series over the years that he did on Leda and the Swan. Uh, one thing about Twombly that I don't really want to go into, and we, it's not really part of our subject matter in this course, um, but he his themes were not always, but very often mythological. This is called Untitled, 
and it was done in 1970. Um, and it, it used to hang at, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I believe it still does. But wait till you see it in context. It's enormous. Uh, Kirk Varnado's wife um, quipped that the painting was so big that it had its own weather. <laughs> um, and so you can begin to understand what it must, what it means to say that you, you have to be in the presence of these works in order to feel really anything at all about them. In 2000, he gave one of two important interviews. Uh, the second was with Nicholas Sirota in 2007, because Twombly didn't like talking about his work. He didn't write about it. He just liked to do it. Um, and as late as 2000, he's, already, he's an old man. He says, this is, I, mean, I use this quote as an example of the of the intensity with which his experience of painting was um, engaged in. He says, I have a hard time now because I can get mentally ill. I usually have to go to bed for a couple of days. Physically, I can't handle it and I can't build myself. You know, my mind goes blank, it's totally blank. I cannot sit and make an image. I cannot make a picture unless everything is working. It's like a state. Um, in one of those interviews, he says, you know, he'll read and read and read, usually poetry or um, um, mythological tales. Um, and he'll read and read and ponder and think. And then, and then all of a sudden, he'll know I'm ready to paint. And many, at least, of his late paintings, well, not even late, Many of his mature works um, were done in that kind of a in that kind of a way, um, which is I think says something. I'm not sure exactly what. Um, this is he, he liked to work and could afford because he was married to a wealthy um, Italian aristocrat. Tatiana, Tatiana Franchetti. Um, his sexual life is complicated and confusing, and you'd have to you'd have to talk about that separately. Um, this is one. Uh, this is panel two of a twelve-panel series about the the Battle of Lepanto, in which the Europeans um, defeated the Ottoman Turks in the Mediterranean. Um, and this is part, here are five of those 12 panels. So you see what it, it means to say that you can't, you can't have a good sense of his work unless you see it. And this is called Goodbye Catullus, Say Goodbye to Catullus, to the shores of Asia, Asia Minor. He spent 20 years working on this, basically in two separate um, sessions. Um, it remained uncomplete for a long, long time. And it hangs in the Menil Gallery, the, the, the Twombly Gallery in Houston. And it's a knockout. Um, there's a story uh, that was told in an article in the New York Times not all that long ago about um, when the gallery first opened. Well, early in the history of the gallery, a woman came in, took off all her clothes and danced in front of this. And um, Twombly was just thrilled. He says, I can't, you know, I can't think of <laughs> any compliment that an artist could receive <laughs> that would be any greater. Um, there, there's, there's his um, series of, of roses that he did. There's a long series of roses that he did late in life. Uh, this is, oh, I don't have a date on it, um, which is too bad, but in the 90s, maybe, or even in the 2000s, I think probably 2000s, but I'm not sure. 
um, these also are large. I'm not too taken with these, but um, but they're worth seeing for sure. Um, leaving Pothos ringed with waves <laughs> um, is a late work, and there were several like this. Um, there's so much to say about Twombly, but I guess I won't do it now. His longtime companion, uh, Nicola Del Rossio, who's still alive and was in charge of the Twombly Foundation, which is immensely wealthy, tells us that in his final two days, Twombly was hallucinating and talking almost exclusively about art. He writes, the last rational description of, of his artistic mental process was, I let it inside to create, to regenerate, to make it stronger rather than let it go out all at once, like a flash in the eye. I made art that regenerates itself. I enjoyed making it so much. Oh, I loved it so much. I still get a kick out of this stuff. It's endlessly fascinating, sometimes maddening. And what I want to talk about a little bit is <sighs> scribbling. Now, one of the things we haven't even mentioned is that um, Twombly's work, in many ways, quite consciously bridges the gap between drawing and painting and writing. Um, and there are often written texts incorporated in his works. And that's interesting intellectually um, in ways that I want to, in some ways that I want to kind of just draw your attention to. Um, this is from 1953, it was done during the North Africa tour that he took with Rauschenberg. He, he, you can, you can, if you go to the catalogues raisonné of Plombly's work, you can find all of these things illustrated. Um, these are from the North Africa sketchbook. Um, this one was actually done in Rome. And so there's these kind of biomorphic forms that he took very seriously and he worked on in his youth, as it were, um, in the early 50s. This is right after he was at the um, at Black Mountain doing those glyph things. And these were based on things, uh, structures, and experiences that he saw and had in um, uh, in Morocco. Um, and they and there's an there's a there's a lot of them. And I just want to want you to look at them and think about them and think of here's a here's a characteristic sketchbook of shapes and. And that he that he saw while traveling in North Africa, and then a couple of years later, he spent one year, I think it was, in the army, where he was very um, ill suited to be. But they put him in um, the cryptography unit, and he spent time in a, in, in Augusta, Georgia. And one of the things that he did while he was stationed there was take weekends away and he went, he would go to a hotel room and would draw in the dark. Um, in order to, he said, to try to unlearn um, the draw, the, all the drawing techniques that he learned as a child, all of these are from 1954. And again, you get these biomorphic um, scribbles, um, which can become pretty random and chaotic. 
And he saved these. These are all in the catalogs of Raisonne. So he's very, what, what, I, I am not an artist. Um, and what strikes me about these, um, after, particularly after going through the catalogs of Raisonne, was that he kept them all. They're very important. Some, he's, trying to, he's trying to discover something here. And now here's one from 1955, after he left the army, moved back to New York and was living um, with Rauschenberg. Uh, um, in Rauschenberg's um, flood, um, uh, you know, loft. I I really wish I had more illustrations um, from the catalogues of Raisonne, because the volume that's devoted to these years um, is full of scribbles like this. One after another, after another. And as you turn the pages, you just think, what was he doing? What was he looking for? Um, every once in a while, one of his paintings or one of his sketches, you'll, you'll, see, a, you'll see a word appear. Uh, it's a bad transition for our purposes. Um, and you know, it's not writing, and it's certainly not illustration. Um, each line is what it is. It is the experience of its own creation. Um, but when you re look through the catalog of Raisonne, you, you, you can't help but be struck by the seriousness of this, which, which one individual um, Illustration. These are small, by the way. These are these are pencil and pen on paper. Um, oh, which which one gives you? I mean, the the diligence and concentration of his search seems either completely insane or incredibly. Um, uh, enigmatic and mysterious, which it sure does to me. This is this is much later. This is um, one of the four seasons. This is spring from 1993 through 95, um, and there's a poem, and I don't remember what it is that you can see sort of written on the right. Um, so even in some of his mature work, there's that sense of scratching and and um, scrawling and almost writing. And then in 2007, I, th I find this particularly um, revelatory. Nicholas Sirota interviews him and says, did you have a model for the Four Seasons? <laughs> Twombly in interviews is always um, really unusual as a speaker, fascinating, kind of dreamy. In fact, um, if you go to them, before I read this, but if you go to the Manila website, you can find, if you look, um, an interview um, with Twombly done by, oh, uh, boy, it's been a few years since I've been into Twombly all that much. Oh, I can't remember the woman's name, but she was a, a, a conservator uh, and um, of paintings, and she she they they toured the Manil Gallery together, um, and you can get a you can get a, a, a listen to his voice, his southern drawl, and his gentlemanly manner, and it's really quite interesting to hear, and get a sense of his um, personality. Did you have a model for the Four Seasons? No, it was from scratch. I mean, I don't know if it was the first time I used that boat because for Twombly, these boats, that's one, two, three, four, five boats and a splotch. Those are boats. That's, that shows up in his, well, we saw it in Lepanto a few slides earlier. It was a Celtic boat I found in England with lots of oars. It was a Celtic model. I don't know where it was from. But later, Kirk Varnado went to India and told me of a boat with a red and yellow banding on the top and gave me the photograph. It was exactly that same Celtic boat. You can't get away from Mother Nature. Do boats have a particular meaning for you? 
Yes, boats. I like the idea of scratching and biting into the canvas. Certain things appeal to me more. Also, prehistoric things, they do the scratching, but I don't know why it started. It's a very basic kind of mark making. Infantile. Lepanto is full of boats. It's all about boats. I always loved boats. Do boats have a particular meaning for you? Yes. Boats. I like the idea of scratching and biting into the canvas. Certain things appeal to me more. Also, prehistoric things, they do the scratching, but I don't know why it started. This is the a photograph, and probably also took Polaroid photographs. So it was a couple of books of his photographs of the Celtic boat model with oars. There's another. So that's what he's referring to when he says boats. And that is that from Quattro Stagione? Let me see. No, oh, it's from Sisastris. Ah, yeah, which is my favorite pan series, um, but I don't think I have it here. This is from, this is also from Sisostris. And this is from Three Studies from the Temeraire. These are all his boats. I like the idea of scratching and biting into the canvas. Also prehistoric things, they do the scratching, but I don't know why it started. And I'd like to contrast and compare that um, kind of idea, those ideas that those feelings of approach to the canvas and the explorations um, that Twombly was doing um, with, with writing in its historical forms. Um, because writing is a technology that has evolved over the years from the original scratches that people made on shells and bones and rocks into the kind of writing and scratching that uh, artists do and that people do when they write, you know? This is um, from the Bacchus series by Twombly. Um, and I, and I, I, I'm just putting these here for your, for your consideration as um, examples of what putting marks on canvas or paper can be and can do with one of his scribbles, the space of writing. What is the space of writing rather than the space of drawing? There have been plenty of philosophers who've written a lot and art historians and art theorists and artists, not so much artists, they just do it. Um, But I had a, I think, uh, here we go. Yeah, I had a, I had a kind of interesting um, experience that I want to relate to you, although I guess I got other things to show you first. Um, you, you notice this, this is known as Academy. It's done in 1955. And down at the bottom in the middle, uh, it's another real big, you know, six by eight or something feet. Um, down, down in the lower middle, you can see that he's scribbled graffiti. Fuck. <laughs> and so and he called it Academy. So, you know, fuck the Academy. <laughs> um, but what's he doing? And you can make out other, other letters here. There's an E and a T and an A. And there's letters. There's definitely letters. You know, this isn't this isn't a pre-literate person scribbling. 
This is a literate person scribbling. So the, the, the transition's been made and we're kind of going backwards, you know. This is, this is a very well-known one. It's called Panorama from 1955. And it was absolutely unlike anything else that was going on. All his work was unlike anything else that was going on in those years. These were years of, of abstract expressionism, uh, Fritz Klein and Robert Motherwell and, 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 and Jackson Pollock. And this is something different. Uh, and exactly what is... Um, is a very good question. It's another very large painting. Here's a small piece of, of, of work on paper. It was done in Rome in, in 1957. Um, you can sort of make out Dear Roma if you look carefully. This also is from 57 and incorporates color. What is he doing? What would you be doing if you had made this? This is a fairly large, it's 50 by 70 centimeters. So it's less than a meter, you know, it's two thirds of a meter. And this starts to show a set of motifs and a kind of style which dominates for quite a while during his uh, 50s, late 50s, early 60s. Now, this is a photograph that I took illegally um, in the Menil Gallery in the room devoted to the Lexington, what are known as the Lexington paintings. And there are one, two, three, four, five of them in there, you know, five or six. Um, and they're, you know, five feet by four feet, or well, they're a little bigger than those, like six feet by five feet. They're, they're bigger. The one on the left is the thing I'm talking about. And the next room with the colored painting, um, that's, that's a separate set of issues. You, you can tour the Menil Gallery by walking in a circle. And this is the second, third room as you go clockwise. And I spent um, the better part of two days there several years ago. I mean, literally six hour days. And it was this room with the Lexington paintings that I spent the most time in. And I don't articulate or write about my experiences about art. I, I don't have a vocabulary. I don't have a archi philosophical architecture. And so I'm not going to explain anything to you. But here's a reasonable facsimile of one. Of, well, it isn't. It's a horrible facsimile because it can't be done of one of these Lexington paintings. Um, after after several hours in this um, gallery, I, I came to the conclusion that the heart of the gallery was were these Lexington paintings. Um, and that if I could find, if I could <laughs> figure out what was going on here, it would be a key to all his other work. And I, and I still think that's probably true Though I don't really know what I mean by that, and I don't really have a have it much in the way of commentary, but these paintings, as you stand and just look at them, they demand. It seemed to me that they simply demanded an intellectual response of some sort. 
Um, but a funny kind of intellectual response. I guess I, I guess I'm rethinking it now. Not an abstract response. Not a theory of art. They make you wonder. They make you ponder. They make you question. They make you ask what is going on in a way that for me, no other art ever has. And they are far richer and more complex and more texturally interesting. Haptic was the word that was used at, at um, the Black Mountain, amongst the Black Mountain College people. Art needed to be understood in haptic ways, that is, textural. Um, touch had to be involved, and Twombly's paintings are almost always, are always profoundly haptic. None of that comes across in reproduction. And here's, here's one of the best things I've ever seen in print about Twombly, and this is from a conversation um, among Kirk Varnado, Richard Serra, and two other um, uh, contemporary artists during the MoMA um, retrospective on Twombly. Um, Richard, they're, they're discussing these kinds of paintings. And Sarah says, I had never seen this way of painting before. And I didn't think this way of painting had ever been seen before. When I, and he's talking about back in the day. When I went through the present exhibition, I was floored by it again, absolutely floored by it. The thing that I admire about Twombly, and he said it best himself, and I think I'd better quote it because the quote's better than anything I could possibly say. Each line now is the actual experience with its own innate history. It does not illustrate. It is the sensation of its own realization. The imagery is of a private or separate indulgence rather than of an abstract totality of visual perception. The imagery is of a private or separate indulgence rather than of an abstract totality of visual perception. Sarah says, so what he's telling you is that every line he makes counts. It counts for its own definition as a thing in and of itself, not to build other things. And he says, there's an early painting called La La or Hoo Ha or something, which is a bundle of lines making a kind of haystack. But this is really, here it is, but this is really about pictograms, about, in a sense, the space of writing It is not about brush stroking. Some people who write, write and then pause and then write in epiphanies. And this has that clustering or opening up. For me, it was an eye opener. In 1959, it was antithetical to the big movements in abstract expressionism. I have nothing but admiration for it. The painting is, in fact, called La La. It's from 1953. That's what we're looking at here. Even this is 50 by 70 centimeters. It's fairly large. There's a long series of paintings that he did, the known, known as the blackboard paintings, and we've already seen um, the the untitled which hangs at MoMA um, and a couple others I think this was done in Rome in 1966 and there's a there's one there's an example of this which hangs in the Menil Gallery and they do have a certain mystery 
and attraction. I think not as much as the Lexington paintings. But there's, there is something here which you really have to be there in purpose to, to get a handle on. This is from 1970. So you see, he kept doing these. And then those, those, those big orange things, um, the Bacchus series, you know, those were done just before he died. It's like 40 years later. <laughs> um, they're certainly not the only things that he did. Um, I mean, his, his work is during over or the course the historical course of it varies a lot um, but there is a, you know, many people have pointed out uh, that these paintings particularly uh, this type um, must have a resonance in his memory with how um, uh, children were taught to write back in the days when Twombly was growing up. Because here, here is a, um, an exemplar of how you were supposed to learn to write using the Palmer method. And here is a, this isn't Twombly, but here's an example uh, of, of um, a worksheet from a student um, in, in the days when the Palmer method was used. Uh, I guess I want to think a little more. I actually, oh, well, here's another, yeah, these are, these are unfinished thoughts. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they're barely thoughts at all. Um, here we go. Here we are back into Lexington paintings. And, and one of the things that occurred to me as I was sitting and looking at them was they're almost geological, I thought to myself. Um, I mean, I've spent some small number of years looking at rocks and rock formations and being really interested in, in um, geology. And when you're looking at these signs and marks and markings, you surely might think of fossils. Um, but there's a kind of natural history. You know, it's, there's something not quite human about the scratches and the splatches and the scribbles. And so in, 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 in one direction, it, it leads to pictograms and the space of writing. And in the other direction, maybe, I don't know, maybe it leads towards the meaningless. Is that what it is? The, the completely stochastic? No, because, because geologists can read, can read marks on rocks. If you know any geology, there's an enormous amount of information in these rocks, but it's not there by anyone's intention. Whereas this was done on purpose with some intention, unspoken, unconscious, subhuman, prehuman, suprahuman, extrahuman, but nonetheless some agency. Whereas the same cannot be said for the surface of a rock. There was agency, but no purpose. And the agency was not personal, but precisely impersonal, however much meaning we might be able to discover in the surface of a stone that was scraped by a glacier 18,000 years ago, as this was. Or stones with fossils embedded in them, which clearly has 
meaning and life in it, immobilized. All of Twombly's, most of Twombly's early works were glyph-like. And Charles Olson was fascinated by glyphs and his, many of his poems and essays and other literary productions in those years and subsequently involved questions of the origin and meaning of writing. And that surely must have if not influenced, at least been part of Twombly's experience at Black Mountain. And this is, this is the, from a couple of pages from the Voynich manuscript, which is an untranslated and <laughs> perhaps untranslatable manuscript. <laughs> Um, in an unknown language, which also raises questions which seem to me to be in some sense pertinent to deciphering Twombly's pictograms. What, what does it mean to read? What, was it, what does it mean to get meaning from marks? on a stone, on a page. What's that process? Is, is surely, surely these are not unrelated activities. The, I mean, if united, if in no other way than by the fact that human beings are involved. Here's another kind of reading. Here's another. What does it mean to read something? What does a, does it, does it have to do with symbols? I, I don't I don't know. Are these things these are all marks on a page? made by human beings. And the mystery of their production is um, astonishing to me at any rate. Oh dear, well here we have, this I suppose is a way to finish um, the treatise on the veil. <laughs> Second version, 1970. Um, this is one of Twombly's major works. I've not seen it, and it doesn't get exhibited all that often, although had I known, I could have seen it in New York a few years ago. Um, I actually think it's not maybe a bad way to finish this. Um, the, the, the big gray thing, that's called the Treatise on the Veil, second version. And it's big. Um, go back. It's set, you know, like 18 meters long. So it's a large picture painting. He calls them pictures. And this is from 1968 called The Veil of Orpheus, which is sort of in the same series. This is the first version of Treatise on the Veil from 1968. It's uh, 25 meters long. No, no, sorry, sorry. Um, it's seven and a half meters long. 
Uh, oh, we don't have time. Here's a video that you can get of the un... Well, let's... Oh, I don't know if I can even do this. Oh, it's only five minutes long. So what do you... How do you transport a... Um, a painting that big, you roll it up. Images taken between every five and 15 seconds played back at a high speed of the installation of the treatise on the veil at the Menil Gallery. I won't, I won't run through the whole five minutes, but this is, this is kind of fun. And, and so this, this process had to be um, undertaken for all of his very large pieces, um, which <laughs> when, I, when I was discussing um, Twombly with an artist friend of mine, she said, well, of course you have to, you know, it's pretty obvious that, that he had lots of money. I said, oh, why? She said, look at the size of the paintings. She says, it costs a lot of money to make a painting that big, just, to, just for the material. And then, of course, not even to think about the transport. Um, <laughs> so now you've got the background, you've got the frame to put this thing on, and now they've got to bring it. Of course, it came from Europe, because he lived in Europe. Um, he did these works in Europe. They were often displayed in Europe. And now you've got this role this is just crazy stuff. Got this huge roll. So you've got to set up. <laughs> and, then you, and then you unroll the thing. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> I won't play the rest of it. But um, there you go. It's, it's pretty great. <laughs> on the veil. Um, these are, these are um, preparatory studies, quite small, um, that were, that are exhibited at the same time as the larger work. And I'm just going to show them to you. I think the more the more that you know, the more familiar familiar you are with Twombly's work as a whole, the more you will see in these of um, themes and motifs that show up throughout his work. But even if you don't, <laughs> and this is, there's something, um, I don't have the vocabulary to react very well to this. There's a way of saying what my puzzle is. You see, I think that's what I mean by his work, some of it, demanding an intellectual response. I think maybe what I mean by that is it requires a vocabulary, an emotional vocabulary, quasi-emotional. It requires, let's say, a vocabulary of the heart. A more than rational intellect in order to make to differentiate and make more real 
and lead us on in our ability to have kinds of experiences that this work elicits. Something like that. It's enigmatic, it's mysterious, it's puzzling and moving. Sometimes it makes me shiver. So it's these sorts of <laughs> ah, it's these sorts of things that I want wanted you to have. There it is, in its completed state, in the back of your mind, as as we are thinking about writing and drawing and painting. And that's pretty much all I wanted to show you. So um, there's the non-narrated version of this um, for your perusal at your own speed. Thanks for putting up with this. I hope you enjoyed it.